Hello and welcome to Imperial Late Online, The Sun, the latest in our public events series exploring research at Imperial College. My name is Annabelle Knight and I'll be hosting this student takeover of the Imperial Late's Day in the Life talk series. Today we're going to be talking about vitamin D and careers in research with epidemiologist Alicia He. Hi Alicia, thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So to start us off, who is Alicia Heath? So I'm a research fellow in cancer epidemiology, but I also work on other diseases like diabetes as well. Um, I actually started out as a biochemist working on infectious diseases, but I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in a science lab. And so I moved into public health and epidemiology to look at things from a population level instead of looking at cells and tissues in a laboratory. At the time, I became really interested in vitamin D because I was fascinated by the fact that it's a vitamin that our bodies can make when we're exposed to the sun. Um, and I was really lucky to get a scholarship to do a PhD looking at vitamin D in relation to cancer, diabetes and mortality. And I had really amazing supervisors and that sort of set up my path ever since then. And then in the final few months of my PhD, which I did at the University of Melbourne, I was offered a postdoc position at the University of Oxford. And it all happened really quickly. I packed up my life in Australia and then two weeks after submitting my thesis, I got on a plane and flew to the other side of the world and I've never looked back since then. Um, I spent two years in the Nuffield Department of Population Health at Oxford and then I've spent the last few years in the School of Public Health at Imperial where I've been working on UK Biobank and the EPIC study which is the European Prospective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition, um, which is a study of more than half a million people in 10 European countries. Wow, so your studies and your research has stretched quite far and wide, but you said it was vitamin D that particularly caught your attention. Can you tell us a bit more about your research into vitamin D and what it found? Yeah, so I looked at the association between blood levels of vitamin D and the subsequent risk of developing type 2 diabetes, cancer and mortality. We found that vitamin D deficiency or low circulating vitamin D was associated with a higher risk of type 2 diabetes as well as higher all-cause mortality and a higher risk of death due to cancer, particularly colorectal cancer also a higher risk of death due to respiratory diseases, particularly chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and also a higher risk of death due to diseases of the digestive system. We also found that low vitamin D was associated with a higher risk of developing colorectal cancer, particularly in women. Okay, and I'm imagining that that was at least in part what you're expecting to find, but you mentioned to us before that there were some slightly more peculiar findings and that was regarding a different type of vitamin D? Yes, yeah, so there's actually two different forms of vitamin D. There's vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Mm -hmm. And D3 is the form that's produced in our skin when we're exposed to ultraviolet B radiation from the sun. And it's also found in some foods like fish and eggs, whereas vitamin D2 is not made by our, bod by our bodies. Um, and instead it's obtained from some mushrooms and some fortified foods and supplements. Um, and in Melbourne, we were able to look at vitamins D2 and D3 separately. And we noticed that when people had high D2, they tended to have low D3. And so we looked at these two different types of vitamin D separately. And we were really quite surprised by the results because we found that vitamin D3 seemed to be beneficial for mortality, whereas D2 seemed to have no effect. Right. Obviously, these results need to be interpreted cautiously because it was based on a small sample of people. But I think overall, the findings suggest that vitamin D3 is the preferred form of vitamin D in humans. And, and that sort of makes sense, really, because obviously D3 is the form that we synthesize in our skin. And that is really interesting because, as you mentioned uh, previously, a lot of foods and supplements, etc., they say they may be packed with vitamin D, but should we be a little concerned or even just curious at what type of vitamin D is involved? Yes, so historically vitamins D2 and D3 were considered to be equivalent because they were both effective in treating and curing rickets. Um, and so I think 
we now know that they're not equivalent or not necessarily equivalent when it comes to non-skeletal conditions. And most processed foods that are fortified with vitamin D don't actually specify on the label which form has been added. I think it would be useful if food packaging labels did indicate which form it is. Um, most supplements these days contain D3 rather than D2. Um, but I think the main thing is just to be aware that there's two different types of vitamin D and they're not entirely the same. So hopefully in the future, we might see a bit more clarification from those food and supplement companies. But next in our talk, we're going to have a quick fire questions round. So clue is in the title, answer as quickly and as honestly as you can. Uh, these are questions on your research and your life as a scientist. So what, what three things do you do each day in your role as a research scientist? Have meetings with co-workers, read some literature and write some code for statistical analyses. How many languages do you speak? That depends on whether I can include Australian as a separate language. Um, but I speak Italian fluently, French semi-fluently, and I also learnt Chinese and Latin at school. Can you tell us a phrase in Italian? In bocca al lupo which means good luck, but the literal translation is into the mouth of the wolf. Um, so it's one of those sayings that doesn't really translate literally, a bit like saying break a leg when you actually mean good luck. Can you describe a career in research in five words? Um, exciting, challenging, collaborative, analytical and enlightening. Favourite hobby? Ice skating. Um, but I also like traveling and long walks and whenever I go somewhere I like to climb mountains or go to the highest point to look at the view from the top. We've got some great photos here of some of your uh, traveling pictures but also tea or coffee? Coffee. What are the perks of a career in research? I think being able to work with amazing people from all over the world, I still get really starstruck by the people I work with and I'm so lucky to be able to collaborate with them. Um, also, you never stop learning and you can work on many different things. I think one of the best things about epidemiology is being, to work, being able to work on several different diseases and looking at the human body as a whole instead of just focusing on one disease or body part. And so I basically never get bored. Um, another advantage of a research career is the flexibility. I think as long as you're productive, you've got some flexibility in terms of your timetable and it's not like a standard nine to five office job. So I think that's really great. Um, and then obviously perhaps one of the biggest perks is going to conferences in some exciting places all around the world. Yeah, and out of all of those cities your research has taken you to, which is your favourite? I would say Tokyo. Um, in 2017, I was really lucky to go to the World Congress of Epidemiology in Japan. And so I went to the conference for a week and then I stayed on for an additional week and went traveling all around Japan. And it was just such a wonderful experience that I would have otherwise never have done. Mm. Uh, favorite sport? Australian football. Three most essential items on your desk. Um, I've actually got a really minimalistic desk because I don't like clutter. So I've just got my computer, my phone and a to-do list. <laughs> and how has your work been affected by COVID-19? Um, we've become reliant on video calls for meetings, obviously. And I think it's been really important to set up regular meetings and to stay in touch with people just to make sure that we keep things going. Um, but overall, the nature of my research has meant that it's been possible to do everything remotely from home, which has been great. And any particular benefits of working from home? Um, I would say definitely saving time by not commuting. So it's been much more relaxing. And negatives of working from home? Not seeing people in person and obviously no conferences and no traveling. Yeah, and I think that's such a big one for all of us right now but hopefully it won't be too long before we're back seeing each other in person. That is our quick fire round finished. Thanks for those great answers. Particularly interesting to hear about Japan. It's definitely on my post COVID travel list. Um, but we just have a few questions now to finish off the talk. So your career has taken you into different areas of science, different countries and into collaboration with lots of different people. 
but if you had to pick, what is the thing you find most rewarding about a career in research? Um, something which I really enjoy about research is mentoring and teaching students. Um, I just think it's great to inspire future researchers and to see that spark and enthusiasm when they do their first research project and then celebrating when they get their first publication. I think being able to help students and junior researchers is probably one of the most rewarding things about a research career. Yes, and lastly, on that note, what advice would you give to anyone considering a career in research? I would say never give up because research can be hard at times or it's hard most of the time. Um, and there's lots of rejections. You'll have papers rejected from journals. You'll spend months on fellowship and grant applications that will be rejected. And you can feel really worthless. And so I think you need to build up resilience and not take it personally and just keep going because all of the benefits outweigh all the things that knock you down. So you've just got to pick yourself up and keep going. And there's just so many positives of research. The people you work with in research are so friendly and they're just such lovely people. It makes it a really enjoyable career. And with that great advice, we're concluding our talk with research fellow epidemiologist Alicia He. Thanks so much for everyone for tuning in for this special edition of Imperial Lates Online and a special thanks to Alicia for sharing her day in the life with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And if you've enjoyed this talk, do check out the rest of the Imperial Lates The Sun programme. We've got loads of great things on over the next week and there is a link in the YouTube description for you to explore what else is to come. Otherwise, that's it from me. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.